In terms of the number of riding aids and function we have, we actually have less than road machines. We don't have uh, electronic suspensions, we don't have uh, ABS, we don't have any stability control. Just we have uh, functions that are very advanced and very well tuned for the track. I'm about to say something that sounds completely backwards. Moto2, the so-called junior class, is actually more advanced than Moto GPP. And the reason why has nothing to do with speed, power, or money. It's all about brains, or rather the brains inside the bikes. I remember the first time someone told me Moto2 had better electronics than Moto GP. I laughed, like, yeah, right. The bikes with 300 horsepower and carbon brakes are somehow behind the ones with 140? No chance. But then I started digging deeper, talking to engineers, reading tech sheets, and watching onboard data. And the deeper I went, the more I realized they were right. Moto2 might be the stepping stone to Moto, GPT some, but when it comes to software, data, and electronic wizardry, the student has outgrown the master. Let me set the stage here. Moto GP is the peak of motorcycle racing. It's where the biggest factories throw hundreds of millions of euros at titanium parts, wind tunnel aero, seamless gearboxes, and ultra sensitive traction control systems. Moto 2, by contrast, is the middle child, more serious than Moto 3, but still a feeder series. The bikes are less powerful, less glamorous, and way less expensive. On paper, Moto GPT wins in every category except one. And that's when I started asking myself a simple question. If Moto GP is the pinnacle, why does it look like Moto 2 riders are working with more advanced electronics packages? The answer is weird, but once you understand it, everything about modern racing starts to make sense. Uh, here's the truth. Moto GP's electronics are deliberately crippled, not outdated, restricted. Since 2016, the series has mandated a standardized ECU electronic control unit and a heavily controlled software suite. That means every team, from Ducati to Honda to Aprilia, has to use the same hardware and a basic software platform approved by the championship. Sure, they can tweak parameters, but they're locked out of writing their own fancy algorithms for traction control, launch control, or anti-wheelie. It's like giving a Formula One team a calculator and saying, no spreadsheets allowed in Fournier I shoot. Why? Because MotoGP was getting too smart for its own good. Before the spec ECU rule, teams were spending insane amounts of money building bespoke software to make the bikes practically ride themselves. Traction control was so sensitive, it could predict a slide before it happened. Engine braking so perfectly tuned it could stabilize the rear before the rider even touched the brakes. It was mind-blowing stuff, but it was also killing the racing. Richer teams had unbeatable tech, privateers couldn't keep up, and riders were becoming passengers. So Dorna, the MotoGP organizers, slammed the brakes. No more factory-level software wars, they said. Everyone gets the same basic toolkit, the rest is up to the rider, and that's where Moto2 sneaks in and flips the script. Because while MotoGP was putting a leash on its electronics, Moto2 was quietly evolving into a data-driven science lab. See, Moto2 bikes might not be as powerful, but their electronic systems are far more open and customizable. They use Magneti Morelli ECUS2, but with far fewer restrictions, meaning teams can gather, analyze, and manipulate a ton more data. They can integrate third-party sensors, build complex data models, and even experiment with advanced telemetry that MotoGP teams are flat out banned from touching. I've talked to Moto, two engineers who straight up told me their telemetry dashboards look like something out of a NASA mission control room. They're tracking suspension travel, fuel pressure, lean angle, throttle mapping, brake temperature, ride height, all in real time, all with high resolution precision. And because the rules are looser, they can write their own scripts to interpret that data. They're doing predictive modeling, machine learning style analytics, and high speed correlation work that MotoGP literally isn't allowed to do. And here's the twist, that's exactly why Moto2 riders often say, 
The jump to MotoGP is easier from a data perspective. They go from working with advanced custom software tools to a spec system that feels simple, less detailed, less flexible. It's like going from a MacBook Pro to a Chromebook. One engineer I spoke to described it perfectly. In Moto2, we're exploring the limits of what the electronics can do. In MotoGP, we're exploring the limits of what the rider can do. And that's the key difference. Moto2 is a playground for technology. MotoGP is a proving ground for human skill. But that doesn't mean the two worlds don't influence each other. In fact, a lot of the data science breakthroughs happening in Moto2 eventually trickle up to MotoGP in other ways. Even if the teams can't directly use that advanced software in races, the insights they gain from Moto2 telemetry still shape how they tune engines, design chassis and train riders. It's like a Formula One team learning about aerodynamics from its junior Formula Two program. The lessons are still valuable, even if the rules are different. The more I looked into it, the more it started to feel like Moto2 isn't junior at all. It's more like the experimental lab of motorcycle racing, a place where ideas are tested and refined before they're handed over to the top class. And ironically, that freedom means the bikes often run more cutting edge software and analytics than their so-called big brothers in MotoGP. I'll be honest, that realization blew my mind. It's because it flips the whole hierarchy of motorcycle racing on its head. MotoGP might be the show everyone tunes in for, saying the speed, the glory, the legends, but Moto2, that's where the future is being built. That's where the next generation of racing intelligence is born. And the best part, this isn't just about fancy electronics or data dashboards. It's about how that tech shapes the riders themselves. And once you understand how Moto2 riders are trained to think, feel, and react with these advanced systems, you start to see why some of them adapt to MotoGP faster than veterans who've been there for years. All right, now that we've flipped the racing world upside down and accepted that Moto2, the so-called junior class, is secretly the electronic brainiac of the paddock, let's talk about what that actually means because the consequences of this aren't just technical, they're psychological, strategic, and downright philosophical. It changes how riders ride, how teams think, and even how MotoGP as a sport evolves. Let me start with the story. A few years ago, I was chatting with a Moto2 crew chief, one of those guys who can read a data sheet like it's a bedtime story, and, and he said something that stuck with me. Our job isn't just to make the bike faster, it's to teach the rider how to think like the bike that blew my mind because that's the fundamental difference between Moto2 and MotoGP. In Moto2, the electronics teach riders how to interpret information. In MotoGP, riders have to teach themselves how to override it. Here's what I mean. Moto2 riders grow up surrounded by data. They're constantly analyzing throttle traces, brake pressure graphs, suspension curves, and GPS overlays. They learn to speak the language of electronics fluently. They know what the ECU is doing when traction control is intervening and how much grip they're leaving on the table. The bike becomes a feedback machine and the rider becomes a scientist, experiment, tweaking, optimizing. Then they jump into MotoGPT and suddenly it's like switching from a Tesla to a go-kart. The electronics are simpler, the data is more limited, the safety nets are gone, and the rider who spent years learning how to work with the bike now has to learn how to dominate it. It's a completely different mindset. And this is where things get fascinating because MotoGP's restricted electronics make the bikes harder to ride, not easier. They slide more, they spin more, they misbehave. The throttle is brutal, the rear tire is alive, and the margin for error is razor thin. There's no AI-like traction control predicting the perfect power delivery. It's all in the rider's right wrist. Every lap is a negotiation between man and machine. That's why you sometimes see Moto2 champions struggle in their rookie MotoGPI season. It's not because they're not talented, 
it's because they're too used to a bike that communicates everything. Now they're on a bike that speaks in grunts and growls, and they have to relearn how to listen. The flip side is also true. Riders who master MotoGP's dumbed down electronics often become absolute monsters. They develop throttle sensitivity that's almost supernatural. Their feel for grip becomes instinctive. They learn to feel traction instead of relying on a dashboard to tell them it's there. Here's where things get even more interesting. Because of these contrasting philosophies, Moto2 and MotoGPT have become like two different types of universities. Moto2 is the engineering school where you learn systems, analytics, and precision. MotoGP is the art school where you throw half the textbook away and learn how to dance on the edge. And when a rider graduates from one to the other, the ones who succeed are the ones who can blend both worlds. They use the scientific discipline of Moto2, but they adapt it to the raw chaos of MotoGPT. And that's exactly why the whole junior versus senior label doesn't really apply here. Moto2 isn't less advanced. It's, it's, it's just advanced in a different way. It's the research lab, the think tank, the sandbox. It's where teams can push the envelope without being handcuffed by regulations. And because of that, the lessons learned there often circle back and influence MGPT in subtle ways. Take predictive analytics, for example. Moto2 teams have been using increasingly complex algorithms to forecast tire degradation and fuel usage based on weather, track conditions, and rider input. That's not something MotoGP teams can directly code into their race day ECUS, but the insights from those experiments do shape their strategies. If you loved diving into the hidden tech battle between these two worlds, make sure you hit that like button, share this video with another racing nerd, and subscribe. Because trust me, there's a lot more madness hiding under those carbon fiber fairings